Well, I hope you enjoyed last week's visit of the Egyptian section of the Met Museum in New York City. This week, we'll explore a few other amazing sections, the Armour Collection, a special Van Gogh exhibit, the Greeks and the Romans, the rooftop deck, and the European painting collection. Looks like she's not going anywhere. This is Andromeda and the sea monster. You know, this stuff, I, I, you know, I hate to make comparisons because everything has its own value, but definitely rivals and maybe surpasses the, the squirrel in Texas. And the pecan in Seguin. But I don't know, you know, I don't know enough about art. Everything has a value. One human's trash is a, another human's treasure, I suppose. Or one Gavugian's, for that matter. It's a beautiful room. Here we go, this is what we're looking for, armor. Right as you walk in to the armor section is this beautiful suit of armor from Milan, Italy, around 1600. It's short, you can tell it, it was made for an adolescent or a small adult, certainly a member of a noble family. It weighs about 42 pounds. I thought it would weigh more than that, actually. Just look at the engraving and the inlaying of the different metals here. Beautiful. This is the armor of Henry II, the King of France, who reigned from 1547 to 1559. The relief is incredibly detailed, covering every inch of this armor. Here on the center of the breastplate, a Roman warrior receiving tribute of arms from two kneeling females. Looks like someone got beheaded here. Mythical sea creatures, it's all there. They're calling it on the placard a uh, parade armor. I mean, really, you'd hate to ruin such beautiful artistry in a life or death battle. This armored skirt, yes, armored skirt, is Austrian from about 1510. The arched cutouts allow the wearer to sit on horseback. Seems impractical in a battle situation especially if you get off your horse. Speaking of horses, here the horse gets some armor too. It's called a chaffron, or a horse's helmet, basically. This is French from about 1600, during the reign of Henry IV. And here we have a beautiful display of armor for both man and horse from Germany, 1548. The armorer, Kunz Lachner, achieved an international reputation for his workmanship. This is the armor of German Emperor Ferdinand I, who lived from 1503 to 1564. Again, it is made by Kunz Lochner. And despite the groin protection in front, they don't seem concerned with the butt area at all. I love this one for some reason. It's so sort of dramatically exaggerated, operatic, I'd say, and it seems to be a very big person who is inside. This is German, and they say it's an example of fluted armor made shortly before the style went out of fashion. Heaven forbid that you'd wear this old armor after it had gone out of fashion. This guy here could hurt you badly just by giving you a hug. And here we have some of the terrible yet still fascinating weapons of the time. War hammers, maces, and battle axes. Check out what they are calling the hand and a half sword, which has to do with the length of the hilt. This is German from 1500 to 1525 or so, and it weighs about four pounds. They say here on the placard that the blade has been inscribed with a mark of the Ottoman arsenal in Istanbul, indicating that the Turks probably took this sword from a European soldier as war booty. And here we get into Tibetan and possibly Bhutanese and Nepalese, they say in the placard. This is 18th to 19th century. And this guy leveled up with weapons. He also had a musket, as well as a bow and arrow. They have this section of beautiful Japanese armor. 
this type of armor at the center of this display is from the 18th century and is called Yoroi and was worn by samurai, which means those who serve. The armor was flexible for ease in battle. Although it doesn't quite look that flexible with all the accoutrements, but maybe this is the sort of pageantry version. Here we really go back in time to the Greek armor. This piece is called the Helmet of Corinthian Type and Pair of Greaves, or Shin Guards. The Greeks didn't wear a lot of armor into battle. The other items would have been a spear, a shield, and a sword. I suppose in some cases a breastplate. Isn't the green patina on these pieces just beautiful? This is from the 5th century BC. Apparently, this statue of Venus is on loan to the Met. It's from the 1st and 2nd century AD, and it has 18th century restorations. There was a period in time where restorations were the thing, and I think since the thinking is you don't restore something, you leave it as you've found it. Ahead of you, you see a marble column from the Temple of Artemis at Sardis. It's from around 300 BC and Sardis is in the modern-day Turkey. The column used to be almost as high as a six-story building. It was made in pieces, and these two pieces were the top and the bottom of the original column. Here we have the marble head of a Greek general, although this is Roman, from the 1st through 2nd century AD. It's a copy of a Greek bronze statue, probably from the 4th century BC. This is the marble head of Zeus Ammon, which is a a mixture of two gods. Zeus obviously is the Greek god of thunder and lightning, the king of all the gods. Jupiter would be his Roman name, and it is a Roman statue from 120 to 160 AD. But he was mixed with the Egyptian god Ammon. Uh, I believe you, the horns on the top of his head would be the Ammon part. And the placard also talks about Alexander's visit to Siwa was a pivotal moment in the young king's extraordinary life. The details are shrouded in mystery, but legend has it that the oracle proclaimed him the son of Zeus Ammon and answered Alexander's questions favorably to his heart's desire. So I guess the oracle told him exactly what he wanted to hear about his godlike ancestry. Ooh, Hercules. Got to check that out. This huge statue just draws you to it. It's Hercules. It's very powerful. He has the skin of the Nominian lion that he slayed in one of his 12 labors. The statue was probably in, in a large public bath area. It was part of a collection assembled in Rome at the beginning of the 17th century by a wealthy banker named Giustiniani. And this tells you what a Roman bedroom in 50 to 40 BC might have been like from the villa of P. Fanius Sinistor at Bascreale. This is a fresco technique, and it's amongst the most complete and important to have survived from this period of antiquity. Okay, we're going to see the uh, Van Gogh exhibit, special Van Gogh exhibit. I was lucky enough on this day to attend this exhibit called Cypresses, which is all about Dutch painter Vincent Van Gogh, or I, maybe it's Van Gogh, but let's go with Van Gogh. And it's a very fascinating period of his life from right after his stay in Paris and moved to the city of Arles. And there he stayed for about 15 months, creating over 200 drawings and paintings of the people and places there. At that time, he saw and started to become fascinated with cypress trees, but I don't believe any of his paintings in Arles, according to this exhibit, really captured the cypress, or at least not in a repetitive, perhaps obsessive way. That came later. Well, the story goes, and you know it, 
He did not have a good ending to his time in Arles because on December 23rd of 1888, he sliced off either part of his ear or his whole ear. The story is not quite clear in the newspapers of the time. And he walked many blocks to deliver this bloody piece by hand to a woman in the red light district. I don't think she appreciated the gift. And then he disappeared into the night, eventually making his way back to his apartments where he was found the next day covered in blood. About five months later, by May of 1889, he had voluntarily chucked himself into an asylum not so far away in Saint-Rémy. And while he was there in this asylum, he began to work on these famous, beautiful, iconic cypress tree paintings. And he actually had an exhibit of these paintings while staying in the asylum, which was called Saint Paul de Mouzal. I feel very lucky to have seen these paintings in person. They were very special. Egyptian themed exhibit on the roof, although this is not uh, ancient. It's inspired by the ancient. Next, I worked my way up to the rooftop and such a beautiful view. The Roof Garden Commission was by Lauren Halsley. Looks like it was completed in this year, 2023. And you get such a great view of the, of the city and you can see how they kind of ruined the skyline with the extra tall buildings there. So, it's the view of the downtown side of the park. We can get rid of, rid of that building. That building, that building, maybe, maybe that building. Don't need those. So now we've made our way into the amazing European painting collection. This is Monet with his distinctive style, Bridge Over a Pond of Water Lilies, 1899. Here's a room mostly full of Paul Cezanne paintings. This stunning piece drew me to it. And apparently these people too, who stood there for a long time, but I finally did get to the painting. It's okay, I'm, I'm just kidding. Enjoy something as long as it, it's, as it calls to you. This is Mont Saint Victoire from around 1902 to 1906. Apparently he worked on this one for a considerable amount of time perfecting it. Here is a most famous image, though this is the final study of the painting and not the final, final painting. I believe that final, final painting is in Chicago. And it's titled, A Study of a Sunday on Le Grand Jacques by Seurat from 1884. Seurat developed what the art world knows as pointillism. And according to the placard, Apparently, he preferred the term divisionism, the principle of separating color into small touches placed side by side and meant to blend in the eye of the viewer. This painting of Tahitian women is called The Siesta. It's by Paul Gauguin around 1892 to 1894. Here is Still Life with Teapot and Fruit, 1896, by the same artist. Now we're getting into a little Renoir in Auguste Renoir's reclining nude here from 1883. He actually paid tribute to André's Grand Odalisque. The original is actually in the Louvre in Paris, but they do have an interesting copy here at the Met of that painting, and he's one of my favorite painters, André. We'll get to him in just a bit. This painting is a Monet. That's his wife, Camille. It's called Camille Monet on a Garden Bench from 1873. She's looking rather sad. I believe her father has just died in the story of the painting, and she's holding a telegraph in her hand. And I believe a top-headed neighbor gentleman is perhaps calling to give his condolences. And now we're moving into the Edgar Degas room. This is the little 14-year-old dancer, which is a statue from 1922. And obviously Degas was interested in dancers at the ballet. He was also interested in bathing nudes. And there's a nice sampling of both of those in this room. Portraits at the Stock Exchange by Degas, 1878-1879. to 
The Dance Class, 1874 by Degas. That's a Degas on the right there, the artist's cousin, probably Mrs. William Bell from 1873. And, but on the left, that's a Manet. And the placard says, interestingly, Manet's sitter emerged from a grim early life to become one of the wealthiest and most fashionable courtesans in Paris. By the time she posed for this portrait at age 31, she had reinvented herself as the Valtesse, a play on the phrase Voltre Altesse, which means your highness, cultivating a coterie of upper crust suitors and admirers among the liberati. She surrounded herself with the trappings of aristocratic luxury. Pretty interesting. Woman with a Towel by Degas, 1894 or 1898. Woman Drying Her Foot, Degas, 1885 to 1886. Woman Having Her Hair Combed, Degas, 1886 to 1888. And here we move into what I said before was one of my favorite painters. I love Angre, Jean-Auguste Dominique Angre. This, as the placard says, is an unfinished repetition, reduced in size and much simplified, of the celebrated Grand Odalisque of 1814 at the Louvre in Paris. This striking painting, which is quite large, you can't miss it, is by Gustave Courbet, French, from 1866. And according to the placard, when it was originally shown in 1866, some critics censured Courbet's lack of taste, as well as his model's ungainly pose and disheveled hair. The provocative picture found favor with the younger generation of artists. You know, one thing that I apparently missed was Rembrandt. And apparently they have Rembrandts and I miss them. But I'm going to show you two that I found on their website, which are quite striking. One is a self-portrait of Rembrandt from 1660, and the other is called Man in a Turban from 1632. I can't believe that I missed them. This painting just jumps out at you because it's creepy and weird and in a good way. It's Joan of Arc, the medieval teenage martyr from the French Provence of Lorraine. It was painted by Jules Bastien Lepage, in 1879, Joan of Arc, as we know, was the patron saint of France. She was honored as the defender of the French nation for her role in the siege of Orléans and her insistence on the coronation of Charles VII of France during the Hundred Years' War. And here they had in this room several paintings by Angre, as I said, one of my favorites. This is a painting of Joseph Antoine Moltedo from 1810, a Corsican businessman and inventor, so these two paintings are kind of paired. Madame Jacques-Louis Leblanc, painted in 1823 by Angre. And this is Jacques-Louis Leblanc, her husband, painted in 1823 as well. And Angre described the man as a Frenchman, very rich and also quite generous and good, who adopted us to the point of overwhelming us with kindnesses and also with requests for paintings, portraits, etc. So writes Angre. And this one, I didn't see this one. I can't believe that I missed it. I don't think I saw it. I would have remembered it because it's so spectacular, this fabric. But apparently it's here in the museum. I can't believe I missed it. And this one has a long name, and I'm going to do my best. Josephine Eleonore Marie Pauline de Gallard de Brazac de Berne. She lived from 1825 to 1860. Princesse de Broglie. It was painted 1851 to 1853. Now... I read that Angre was actually very uncomfortable with portrait painting, but you would not know it because his portraits are quite amazing. He painted this towards the end of his life, and this was actually the artist's final commission. It was said on something I listened to on the website that his anatomy, even with the big swaths of cloth here, is perfect. And one of the reasons for that is he would paint the upper-class woman and then he would do a version of it with a nude model to get the anatomy perfect underneath. Quite interesting. And I've always loved this painting by Jean-Léon Jarome from 1890. It's Pygmalion and Galatea. And obviously this sculptor's sculpture has come to life. She was brought to life by the goddess Venus, which was Pygmalion's wish. And finally, I was so excited this is on loan to the Met, so lucky me. This, this painting is called Flaming June. It's by Frederick Lord Layton 
who is British from 1895. I don't know, just something about the, the composition, the color, the fabric. It's, it's so striking in person. It just uh, draws you in. Uh, I love this painting. We ran out of time. <laughs> Could have seen so much more, but it's time to go now. Hope you enjoyed today's visit to the museum, the bat, and I will see you next week. By the way, very quickly, if you like the show, consider Buy Me A Coffee to help support the show. Buy Me A Coffee is a great way for creators and artists to accept one-time support or membership ongoing from their fans for the price of a coffee. Go to buymeacoffee.com slash brainfire to help the show. Thank you.